I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times close up from golden boy to punching bag. Just a few months ago, Governor Cuomo was lavished with praise for his leadership in the COVID crisis. It featured blunt, factual daily briefings. Now he's being beaten up after his administration admitted withholding data on the COVID death toll in nursing homes. The Democratic Attorney General issued a scathing report about the issue. The FBI and U.S. Attorney have opened inquiries. Democrats in the legislature want to strip him of his pandemic emergency powers. At his council last week, Cuomo said, quote, I accept responsibility for all of it, period. The Times reported Cuomo also ripped into his critics and said, quote, we created a void by not producing enough public information fast enough and conspiracy theories and politics and rumors fill the void. Well, how serious is the political damage for the governor who may seek another term? And I can't resist who had a worse week, Cuomo or Ted Cruz. Jesse McKinley is the Times' Albany Bureau Chief, and we're joined, too, by Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph, contributing writers for the Times. Eleanor, also the author of The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg, just out in paperback. Jesse, of course, uh, developments keep happening in Albany, as they are prone to do. But tell us, what did the governor actually do wrong? And does all this center on the information about the nursing homes? And is this a cover-up? Is this deliberately withholding information? Or, or what happened? Well, you know, cover up is a loaded word, but I think it's it's indisputable at this point that the governor absolutely, you know, withheld information from state lawmakers and, and by extension but from the public. You know, he himself has now admitted to that. Uh, their excuses have been varied, but the, the thrust of it was that they were basically worried about this uh, DOJ, Trump administration, uh, push to try to kind of, you know, get, get an investigation rolling into Cuomo's administration last fall. Uh, the Cuomo administration says, well, basically we froze, we were faced with this DOJ request, we had to deal with that first, so we couldn't give information to, uh, you know, the citizenry and or the lawmakers uh, promptly. Now, the problem with that is that months and months and months passed since they, you know, went and gave the information to the DOJ, so it, in terms of a plausible explanation, it kind of fell short. And then, of course, the governor basically came forward, you know, in the last couple of weeks and said, yes, we, we take responsibility. Yes, we, you know, we, we fell down on the job here. But he also fell short of a full apology. And, you know, this is a very emotional issue, the nursing home issue. These are, these are people's parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters who, who were in these homes. And there's a, a sense that the, the, the government and the governor were not being straight with people as to how serious a problem how many deaths were occurring in these institutions. And I think that's really at the heart of the matter. People were dying in nursing homes. Did the governor or did the state do anything wrong other than withhold that information? Could the governor and the state of New York have prevented those deaths? Well, I, I think what it's a great question. And I think it's a question people are gonna be looking into and analyzing, but. The problem is it, it's impossible to determine whether or not, you know, make a, a good rational determination whether or not those policies were wrong if you're not getting the good data. You know, it's it's like saying, you know, the, the Yankees were winning the game in the sixth inning and, and the game goes nine innings, right? It's 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 incomplete data you're, you're operating with. Um, and that's what the governor admitted to. And the second part of this, which probably Ben and Eleanor can speak to is, is the governor, you know, they, he made a great reputation for himself last spring by being this kind of no nonsense, just the facts, you know, chief executive, you know, Trump's not gonna tell you the truth, I am gonna tell you the truth. And this just blows a hole in that entire image and that entire brand. Eleanor, is this one of those cases of the press, you know, just building someone up, putting them on a pedestal and then uh, enjoying the experience of tearing them down? Listen, you know, um, Andrew Cuomo climbed on that pedestal himself. I mean, I keep thinking this is, uh, and, and Clyde and I have talked about, this is a, another case of Icarus. You know, he's flying too close to the sun and, uh, you know, he- The father, but the son. 
<laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. And so, uh, and so, you know, really, um, really, I mean, he was enjoying being everybody's hero, especially when Trump was there. And so, um, in some ways, he was a good match for Trump because he is, you know, I mean, Jesse wrote this piece, wonderful piece about how people get, uh, if you haven't been yelled at by Andrew Cuomo, you just, you know, you're just a nobody practically. So, um, I mean, he does yell, he does scream. He's a, you know, uh, a, he loves being a tough guy, you know, rides around on a motorcycle, all that sort of stuff. And that was probably really, a really important uh, facet of his personality when Trump was there. Suddenly we're in, you know, we're, we're in a world where this sort of anti-Trump uh, bully is, it doesn't feel as comfortable as it did a year ago. So, um, I mean, I think, I mean, that's just image. I, uh, Jesse is, has uh, carefully outlined what uh, investigators are gonna be looking at about, you know, whether or not he, he uh, caused extra problem in, in, in nursing homes by putting people in there. So, um, you know, there's, there are a lot of layers of seriousness. And also it's his third term. You know, everybody knows third terms are a jinx. So we'll see. And it was um, pretty important, as you say. And I remember when his father, Mario, was running for a fourth term, it was very right. hard to get him to explain a rationale for why he was seeking a fourth term, other than the fact he was there and an incumbent. And, you know, he said he hadn't finished his work. Clyde Machiavelli said, it's better to be feared than to be loved. Uh, <laughs> does that apply to Andrew Cuomo as well, or have times changed since Machiavelli? It's better yet to be both. Uh, and at the moment, Mr. Cuomo, so actually, I think Jesse is the perfect reporter for this story, having been a theater reporter before, because uh, there is an element of classic Greek tragedy here in terms of hubris and, and just raw arrogance, uh, which, by the way, was a problem for uh, the senior Cuomo, too, uh, uh, without question. Um, Looking ahead to the uh, the election next year, if he assuming he runs, I suspect there's a lot of uh, 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 Oedipal stuff going on there, and he wants to get the fourth term that his father didn't. But it's worth remembering. I know we've said this in, uh, in months ago, but um, with the exception of Chuck Schumer, no major New York uh, elected fig uh, uh, official who sought a fourth term has made it. Uh, Ed Koch couldn't as mayor. Al D'Amato didn't do it as senator, and Mario Cuomo didn't do it as governor. So uh, Nelson Rockefeller did, but then he didn't did. But that was a long time ago, obviously. And yes, Schumer's the only Schumer's the only contemporary. Well, I mean, uh, the uh, Rockefeller last one in 1970, uh, half a century ago. Uh, yeah, no, he's got problems. Uh, if I were he, I would try to emphasize that he did not lie about the overall numbers. I believe of dead. Uh, as a result, simply shifted it from column A to column B, if you will, which is no small sin, but it is uh, at the least, uh, they did not undercount, I, I believe I'm right on this, they did not undercount the, uh, the death toll. And, uh, and that's worth remembering. Jesse, one of the things I found striking, your story about him uh, in the Times, uh, I thought was right on the nose and uh, also right down the middle, but it attracted something like 700 comments from readers uh, on the website. And a lot of those comments were relatively favorable, saying, all right, so what if he's a bit bully? He's been a reasonably good governor. And what do you expect? This is politics. Uh, were you at all that uh, people seemed less concerned about the personality and, and more about the issues in general? They either liked his record as governor or they didn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think there's two camps. I think there's people that are going to say, look, he's he might bark and bite or, and, and, you know, be a bully sometimes, but he gets things done and he was the, he was the bully for the moment. And, you know, that school of thought certainly has its, its, its acolytes and its believers. Um, but, you know, the thing that, that kind of came up for me when I was reporting that story was whether or not this kind of politics, which of course is New York politics, right? You know, you punch hard and you, you counter punch and you know, the, the former president knew that all too well and was kind of 
you know, bred in the same in the same pool. But the question is whether or not that type of politics has seen its day and is on the decline. You know, you're talking about a world in which things like toxic masculinity and abusive workplaces and mansplaining, these are concepts that are now in kind of wide circulation and are generally frowned on and in some cases fireable offenses, you know? I wonder if, if Cuomo, who's 63 and obviously has been kicking around New York politics for four decades, might have kind of crested and now be facing something that he is not accustomed to, which is a, a different society, a different place in the world where people aren't, aren't cool with people yelling at people in the workplace. You know, the voters at the end of the day will probably be the determiners of that question. But for me, it was interesting when I was reporting to think about that. Eleanor, what do you think? Uh, is there a nice uh, Andrew Cuomo sitting there? Uh, can he change? Can he adapt? Uh, and also in the mayoral race, does anybody really want his endorsement? Is that going to be considered a point? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure they do now. What I was thinking was really interesting. You know, he came after Assemblyman Ron Kim and, you know, just really, you know, just almost screamed at him uh, about him on television, which is really, really very odd. And he's turned out to make him something of a hero in uh, not only in the legislature, but in the city. And, it, and, it, and it's really interesting. A lot of the mayoral candidates have been asked about how they would deal with Albany. And they're very careful uh, not to step on Cuomo's toes because, you know, they don't, they really don't need the full Cuomo blast. And so many people in the city feel that Mayor de Blasio made a big mistake when he started attacking Cuomo because de Blasio really wasn't in the same league as Cuomo. If you were going to get in a fight with Cuomo, you better be a, a junkyard dog. And that was the last thing uh, de Blasio was and is. Uh, Clyde, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, politicians do stupid, uh, ill-timed things. I said I was going to ask about Ted Cruz. Uh, how do you explain leaving Texas in the middle of uh, a storm like that and taking a vacation in Mexico? Arrogance mixed with stupidity. It's a terribly toxic combination. I mean, you got to be an idiot to leave your state when it is in that kind of condition. Everything that he said since then... Uh, uh, just confirms that he's not, despite his uh, uh, academic record, uh, not the sharpest pencil in the box. Look, he brings back the Al uh, Franken line about uh, uh, Ted Cruz. He said, I like Ted Cruz more than uh, any of my uh, fellow senators like Ted Cruz. And I hate Ted Cruz, he said. Uh, uh, and Ted Cruz is just a loathsome figure uh, to everybody. He came in the Senate as a loathsome figure and he continues. He barely beat Beto O'Rourke the last time out. We'll see if he's going to be finished. On these types of scandals, I, I, I tend to lean toward the voters have short memory uh, theory of politics. And so between now, to get back to uh, Governor Cuomo, between now and next year, uh, uh, 20,000 things are going to happen. And, and we'll see. And, and despite what I said earlier about the fourth term jinx, I suspect he's got a fair reservoir of, of reasonable will and whether, and, and as, as you were saying before, he yells at his staffers. I'm not sure a lot of people are gonna care about that. Amy Klobuchar in our own pieces did not come across as you know, soft and cuddly, quite far from it. Uh, nonetheless, she was a serious presidential contender for quite a while. That's right, and also a shortage of opponents. Jesse, a real quick question. Why Liz Kruger immune from being yelled at? That's, that's a fantastic question. That was one of my favorite bits of reporting in that. Yeah, she was on the do not yell list. Um, uh, you know, I think anyone who's tangled with Liz Kruger, they know she's pretty no nonsense too. So she might be, might be willing to give as good as she gets, I suppose. Sounds like a good reason. Thanks to Eleanor Randolph, Clyde Habram, and Jesse McKinley of the New York Times. And coming up next is this the year Washington cracks down on big tech. Needless to say, bipartisanship is in short supply in Washington, but this year there may be support from both sides of the aisle for cracking down on big tech. 
Many Democrats and Republicans think tech giants like Amazon, Facebook, Google are way too powerful. Conservatives think social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook discriminate against them. Others are angry at the role technology played in helping insurrectionists organize the deadly January 6th assault on the Capitol. In the New York Times column headlined, Big Tech Has Helped Trash America, Kara Swisher wrote, quote, digital hate and misinformation finally jumped out of the screen and into the real world in the form of a mob that attacked the Capitol after having been incited to violence by the president and technology played a major role. Few will now deny that the miraculous tools that Silicon Valley has invented have been badly perverted. Kara Swisher is a contributing opinion writer for the Times, host of the popular Times podcast Sway, and one of America's premier tech journalists. Kara, how do we control uh, big tech social media like that? And where is the, the line between that and newspapers, television, uh, radio, in terms of use of public airwaves and free speech? How do we reconcile those two things. I mean, why can you stand out on a corner and ha hand out leaflets, uh, but not uh, say things like hate speech on social media? Well, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, you say, how can we deal with tech? We don't haven't dealt with it at all. It has no uh, restrictions and many other industries, including uh, the airwaves uh, the, as the FCC, newspapers are bound by libel laws and everything else, but there's absolutely no laws per, uh, hindering tech at all uh, in what they've done over the last, you know, 20 years, essentially. Um, there is one law that actually protects them from immunity. And so they have sort of had a free ride in terms of liability forever since they started. And it was a good thing to do at the start because these companies would have actually been sued out of existence because they are, they had a lot of third party people on their platform, but things have changed and they become much more like the media than they are a, sort of a benign platform. They're not exactly like say a phone company that just transmits people using them and they transmit voice and the phone company doesn't hear anything. The social media companies especially do a whole lot of editing. They do a whole lot of different activity that moves things or promotes things or likes things. And so they're, they're, they're living somewhere in this weird nether space between a publisher and a, a platform. And they, they in fact call themselves platagers, which is a terrible word, a typical tech word. Um, and so it, the question is, how do we then deal with this going forward? And what are the big issues? What are the actual big issues? And what are the ones that are super noisy, like around the First Amendment? So what are those issues and how do we monitor it? How do we build a legal framework to say what's okay and what isn't, and then how do we enforce that? Well, the first thing is understanding what the First Amendment actually says. And it's, you know, I always joke that it's the first and it's short, so you should be able to find it easily. But it actually says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. And, and that means just Congress, not Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or whatever site you happen to be using or TikTok. So they can make rules and they do it all the time. And so that's one really interesting thing. They're always sort of calling about talking about free speech, but in fact, they, they, they abridge it all the time whenever they feel like it. And, and it, they sort of have these rules, but they tend to be random and randomly enforced as with President Trump. And so the First Amendment comes into play in sort of an interesting way in that Congress really can't do anything about a lot of things people say, and especially legislating these tech companies. That said, because they're so big and they're so pervasive, the question is what, what position do they serve? They're a public square, but they're private companies owned by billionaires. And so what, what are the regulations that need to come into place? They're also incredibly concentrated. And that's something America knows a lot about, whether it's its phone company or IBM or trains or John D. Rockefeller. And so they sort of advantage themselves as being the only outlet, the only public square and quashing innovation for new public, sort of public private squares or quasi public squares. And so I, I like to focus on a couple of things there, the monopolization they have over these, these communication systems. And then secondly, their ability uh, to, 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 to quash innovators going forward. And that's really where the problem is. And then lastly, I guess, liability over certain things that happen on their platform. They have no liability. And that's, an, that's a get out of jail free card uh, that very few people, very few companies have in their, in their growth, especially the most powerful companies in the world.
So if members of Congress came to you, and I'll bet some of them have, and said, okay, yeah. what are the top three things we should do to yeah. get a hold of big tech to you know, get some sort of reins on it, what would you do? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think you remove it from sort of the politicization of it. Uh, you know, I think most people on the conservative side, there's been no proof that there has been any any bias going on. They like to say it, but it doesn't mean it's so, you know, it's like sort of saying whatever fantasy you have, that's not what's happening there. I think you focus on three things. One is liability. What are the proper liability protections that should be in place and what should they be liable for? They are not liable at all. And so that's a question of reforming Section 230, not eliminating it, because eliminating it would be disastrous to lots and lots of people that, and the unintended effects would be massive, especially to small companies. The second one is uh, data protection of consumers. They they manipulate data in ways, and they and it's very it's not very transparent of how they use data. And we don't have very stringent data protections in this country. And that's a very easy way to to, to deal with them. To put in place strong data protection laws, including private a privacy a national privacy bill. These companies have gotten a free ride on the ability of them to take advantage of people's data. And so that would be something that would would definitely go right to their pocketbooks in that regard. And lastly, taxes. Like anybody else, like if you think that these companies have a negative effect on society, just like cigarettes, just like sugar, just like liquor, you can tax it. Is there a way to do a social media tax? And I think everyone realizes there's issues around addiction, around radicalization, around all kinds of things that maybe there's a tax we could put on them where we would use that money for election information uh, promotion, good info uh, election uh, promotion, not let them do it at their will, or li media literacy, or all kinds of things. And so there's lots of tools they have, and they also have fines. They have possibility of antitrust action, which I think is sort of the last thing you should do. Um, but there's ways to, to break up these companies and promote innovation without having to do things that take forever and usually don't result in much, except the strong get stronger. We've seen the latest conflict in this issue in Australia, but what impact would you say they've had on news coverage and the ability of the news media to survive, particularly local news? Well, in some ways it's been great. You know, you can reach more audience and in other ways they've sucked up the actual thing, which is digital advertising. And they get, in that trade, they get most of the advantage. Even though they say we send clicks, we do this. Essentially the media has been painting their fence for years. And I know it makes a small part of their, their, uh, their revenue, but the fact of the matter is it makes it a more attractive place with everybody talking. I mean, we literally give, it, it is like, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer and painting the fence in a lot of ways. And we're sort of stuck because there's no other place to go, right? You don't have choices to where you can find audience. Um, and so what happened in Australia is, is very complex because on one side you have a very monopolistic media uh, or environment there in Australia sort of dominated by News Corp. And then you also have Facebook and others that have been dominating the news distribution system. So they should work out some sort of payment system depending on what it is, Not certainly not for links, uh, but in some way that media gets paid for helping these platforms attract more customers and getting a piece of that data, data flow that they get. You're doing the Sway podcast for the New York Times. You write opinion, you land scoops, you launch conferences, media companies, yeah. uh, different instruments, you say, in your orchestra. And you say each mode is in the service of one thing, which is making good journalism. How do they compare and uh, which is the best form of good journalism or do they all complement each other and are they, are they all in effect in harmony with each other? Well, I try to make them in harmony. I actually don't call them an orchestra. I call them a weapons of war. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm teasing. I don't do that. Um, you know, I think about, I think one of the things that media people do is they tend to put silo themselves in certain areas. And I never thought that way. I think a lot of things complement each other and that they, you know, you tend to, at the beginning of the web, the web people were over in another building. I never understood that, right? It was the print people on the web. I don't even, everything is media. And so I, that's, I've thought about that for a long, long time. And so if it works for me to do a live Twitter thing or, 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 or something on TikTok, that's what I'll do. That's how I'll tell the story. If it works in a print form, I'll do it that way. If it works better on a, in a long, like Sway is long and they're long in-depth interviews. And so sometimes that works better for, for the medium. Then I could take some of those learnings and maybe put them in a column. I think that's, that's what you have to do if you're a media person these days. You have to understand all the various platforms at your disposal and use them 
correctly, whether you're trying to get people to listen by doing an interesting tweet, or I did a whole interview with Jack Dorsey on Twitter, which was a disaster, by the way, because um, it didn't have the right, didn't have the threading tools in place. So it was like herding cats. Um, but I always try to think of new ways to do it. And then in terms of live, I think some, well, now you can't do it because of COVID and we've had to cut back on that. We've done all these really interesting virtual events that I've been part of. Um, and so I think the whole idea Sorry, this one, right, exactly. So I think the whole idea is to get information to people in the way they like it. Um, I think I would observe many years ago when I was very leaning really heavily into online, uh, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, um, they were very interested in the print edition. And I said, you know, and they were trying to get young people to read. And I was trying to focus on them. I said, if young people want the news printed on salami and they want to eat it, let's do that. Like, let's figure out a way to do it and, it, and not think that it diminishes the quality. You can put quality information in lots of ways. And it's not just to attract young people, it's because consumers are changing how they consume things, whether it's on Netflix, they don't want to go to movie theaters, and we should follow that and we should lead that at the same time. Almost a yes or no answer. Should Trump be allowed on social media? Which one? <laughs> Depends yeah. on which one. I think he, when he violates the rules, he should be kicked off. That's how I would put it. He should be allowed on it until he violates the rules. And he certainly did that at Twitter. He did it at Facebook. Um, he's done it on, you know, he's done it lots of places, but he, um, he gets corrected quicker in a television setting sometimes when the reporters are actually good. Um, so I think the Twitter made a right decision about that. And so did Facebook at the time because he was so violating all the rules mm -hmm. and he did incite violence, which is the brightest red line for these companies. Uh, whether they let him back on, I think Twitter's not gonna let him back on and shouldn't, it's a ban for life. Facebook right now, the Facebook oversight board is deciding. So we'll see, no, not on Twitter and Facebook. I don't think, I think he, he soiled those platforms rather uh, extravagantly. Thanks for joining us. Kara Swisher, Sway, The New York Times, and for The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts. Thanks, Sam.